You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from theheart.org on Medscape. You can now access the latest in medical news on your Amazon Alexa-enabled device. Join me, Perry Wilson, every weekday morning for Medscape Medical Minute, where I highlight the top medical stories of the day. To add Medscape Medical Minute to your flash briefing, search for Medscape Medical Minute on Amazon and click Enable. Or open the Amazon Alexa app, go to Skills, search for Medscape Medical Minute, and click Enable. Then say, Alexa, what's the news? Or, Alexa, what's my flash briefing? I hope you'll join us. Hi, everyone. This is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology, and this is This Week in Cardiology for November 6th, 2020. This week... America, COVID, AF ablation, overuse, heart failure guidelines, and American Heart Association brief preview. For six months, I've started the podcast with a couple notes on COVID. Well, today, the turmoil of the election, one that still hasn't finished counting votes, draws everyone's attention and makes cardiology seem small. I will say only one thing, then move on. The French aristocrat who wrote so famously about the American experiment, Alexis de Tocqueville, said that America is great because she is good. If America ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. My friends, social media is not, not representative of real America or real Americans. The real America, the one that I live in and care for patients in, will continue to be good. And thus, I think, We will continue to be great. This will pass. It will. Trust me. Now to COVID. It's still bad. There are some tiny hints of positive news. I saw reports that in Belgium, one of the harder hit European countries, that they announced this week that their hospitals will not likely be overwhelmed. Here in the U.S., cases continue to rise. But, but, whether it is due to testing people who are less ill or lower risk, or a better understanding of treatment, or all of the above. I cannot yet see that deaths have risen significantly, and it's been 30 days since cases began rising. Here at my hospital in a medium-sized U.S. city, we have seen a modest rise in hospital admissions, but hardly any rise in ICU admissions or patients on vents, at least as of yesterday. An intensivist told me that there are definitely more cases on the wards, but thankfully not yet in the ICUs. This could change in the next week or two. Now, one hugely positive sign. This is big. My hospital used to play a few seconds of here comes the sun over the hospital PA system whenever a COVID patient was discharged from the hospital. Now, I know this should have made me happy, but I couldn't help think about all the suffering going on from other communicable and non-communicable diseases of the human condition. I would think of the patients on the palliative care unit, those with dementia, pain, cancer, and heart failure. Why don't patients who struggle with other illnesses get a song? The fact that it doesn't play anymore tells me that we are adjusting to COVID as another disease that strains the healthcare system, and I see that as a good sign. Next topic is AF ablation. JAMA published a randomized clinical trial in the AF ablation space. And RCT should always be celebrated. They are hard to do. And I salute the authors of the Venus trial, specifically Dr. Miguel Valderbano from Houston Methodist DeBakey. As many of my listeners know, I am a reluctant and cautious AF ablation doctor. When we do this inelegant procedure, we ought to have the data for the best way to do it. The Venus trial asked the question as to whether alcohol ablation of the vein of Marshall improves outcomes over more standard AF ablation in patients with persistent AF. Now, alcohol ablation of the vein of Marshall is a nifty procedure in which a couple of cc's of pure alcohol are injected into the vein of Marshall and it results in ablation of the perimitral area anterior to the left-sided pulmonary veins and on the ridge between the appendage and those left-sided veins. This is a difficult area to ablate. I have done alcohol ablation of the vein of Marshall to assist in getting perimitral block for perimitral flutters. Of course, the most common reason to have perimitral flutter, though, is having had a previous ablation, a.k.a. having a doctor being in your left atrium. Okay, back to Venus. The first thing one does when looking at an RCT is to ask who were the patients. 
In Venus, 50% of patients had persistent AFib for more than two years. It's a long time. 90% had had persistent AFib for greater than six months. This is a tough group because the duration of AFib inversely correlates with the successful restoration of sinus rhythm. Now, a quick note on how little agreement there is on how best to approach patients with persistent AFib once they're in the EP lab. At the Western AFib Conference in Utah, Nasir Marouche usually has a panel discussing approaches to persistent AFib. The panel has five to six experienced operators. There are usually five to six different approaches to persistent AFib. Translation, we have no idea what is the best approach. So the Venus trial was done in 13 centers in the U.S. and Canada. About 340 patients were randomized to catheter ablation via the standard approach or catheter ablation with alcohol ablation of the vein of Marshall. The primary endpoint was the typical freedom from AFib or AT for greater than 30 seconds after a single procedure without antiarrhythmic drugs at 6 to 12 months. The main results, 49% in the catheter ablation plus the vein of Marshall group were free of AFib versus 38% in the standard catheter ablation, and that difference of about 11%, p-value was 0.04, so just barely met significance. The AF burden was skewed. About 10% of both arms had extremely high burden AF, but 78% had AF burden of zero in the vein of Marshall group versus 68% with the AF burden of zero in the standard group, and that statistical difference was about 0.03. A caveat here is that the statistic included multiple procedures and or antiarrhythmic drugs. However, in the supplement, it's always in the supplement, the percent of AF burden at 12 months overall between the two groups did not differ. The authors finally concluded that, quote, addition of vein of martial ethanol ablation to catheter ablation compared with catheter ablation alone increase the likelihood of remaining free of AFib or atrial tachycardia at 6 or 12 months. So you ask, should this procedure be added to the typical AF ablation? I would say a hard no. And my four criticisms of Venus are not personal. I still think it's a great trial. First, there were 27 patients in whom the primary outcome could not be ascertained because of lack of monitoring data, and only about half the patients in Venus had a loop recorder monitoring. These are important facts because recall that the p-value for the primary outcome was 0.04, so a couple of events either way could have easily tipped the results to non-significance. Second, AF burden is arguably a better measure of AF ablation success, and if you look at overall AF burden, there was not even a signal of benefit. Third, the comparator group was treated very aggressively. Now, even though the STAR AF2 randomized controlled trial, this was a seminal trial, found no benefit to ablation outside of a standard PVI lesion set, 95% of patients in both groups in Venus received ablation beyond standard PVI. So this means this was really a trial comparing massive left atrial ablation versus really massive left atrial ablation. I'm not sure why the AF operators don't stick to the evidence at hand from STAR AF2. Fourth, this brings me to the complication rates in these 66-year-old patients. In a trial of 340 patients, there were seven neurologic events, including three strokes. There were seven pericardial effusions. 11 patients had groin complications, and seven had pneumonias. Now, the differences in between groups and complications were not much different. But I think one of the most important findings from this paper may be that overly aggressive, non-evidence-based ablation outside the pulmonary veins is hazardous. The vein of martial ablation technique with alcohol is a nifty trick for helping with perimitral block, but I think the Venus trial does not give enough evidence to start using it routinely for typical ablation. Next topic, and this one I love. It is five practices to avoid in pediatric cardiology. The American Academy of Pediatrics is on a hot streak lately. Earlier this year, they wisely recommended opening schools for in-person learning during the COVID pandemic. More recently, they announced recommendations as part of their Choosing Wisely campaign after reviewing evidence pertaining to practices that are common during pediatric visits. Journalist Marsha Freilich has great coverage of this story. 
But here's a brief recap. First, do not routinely do an ECG for sports participation. Now, I am a huge fan of the ECG. I think we can get a lot of information from it. But doing ECGs in young people who feel well is a potential disaster in our fear-driven, risk-averse health system. Second, do not routinely do an ECG before starting ADHD therapy. I guess the only thing I would add to that, and this is pure opinion, a gut feeling, so to say, is that perhaps there should be a do not use pills for ADHD unless you have tried 15 other things first. The third and fourth recommendations were do not routinely do an echocardiogram for syncope or chest pain. Well, I've said this before, but echocardiograms increasingly scare me. This is for the same reason as ECGs, as they lead to downstream cascades from working up some of these unknown shadows. The fifth do not do is to do not do troponins for chest pain. Now, thank goodness this came up, for it is another reason for me to remind listeners that troponins should not, should not be ordered unless you suspect the patient is having an acute coronary syndrome due to plaque rupture, a type 1 MI. Since kids don't have plaque rupture or type 1 MIs, measuring troponin only risks bringing on further testing. Keep in mind also that athletic literature has multiple studies showing that prolonged vigorous exercise can increase troponin levels, and this problem is only going to get worse with higher sensitivity troponin assays. Next topic is a paper on heart failure performance measures. A new revision of the AHA ACC performance measures for heart failure has been published. The document is pretty timely because the last performance measures were in 2011. It's a long time ago. Journalist Richard Mark Kirkner has full coverage, but I'll highlight some of the things that I like and others that I want to push back a little bit on. Now, first off, one of the smartest guys on Twitter is Senior Arthur. So kudos, Dr. Bobak Zian. In total, there were 13 performance measures that were highlighted. I like to focus on symptom and activity assessment. I always ask patients what they can do. Do you go to the grocery? Do you walk your dog? What is that cane or walker for? It's really important to understand what patients with heart failure can actually do. Also like the emphasis on mineralocoid receptor antagonists and also checking labs. MRAs seem really wise to me, but hyperkalemia is clearly a worry. Also like the addition of the ARNI drugs. I mean, I'm not sure how much better the ARNI drugs are than full dose RAS inhibition. And if my friend, Dr. Milton Packer is listening, I wish we had a fair comparator. But nonetheless, ARNI inhibitors deserve to be added to performance measures. I like the addition and emphasis on CRT, but we all know that CRT is helpful in patients with left bundle branch block and cardiomyopathy. But here's what I would have loved to have seen added and focused on. CRT implant is not enough. CRT needs to be assessed after implant to make sure it is working. A doctor treating patients with heart failure needs to recognize or even document that CRT is actually happening. How can you tell if CRT is happening? An ECG shows adequate resynchronization. Remember, if AFib is over the rate limit of the CRT, you won't be having biventricular pacing. These are important things to recognize. A couple of other things that perplex me about heart failure recommendations and performance measures in general. Okay. Why do we allow oodles of ACE and ARBs when only a handful have been studied? That must assume there is a class effect. Losartan, for instance, has no RCT level of evidence, but it's okay in the performance measures. Well, what about the class effect with beta blockers? Why do we specifically include only bisoprolol, carvedilol, and metoprolol XL? I know those are the drugs studied in the trials, but I wonder why can't we use other beta blockers? Another problem I have with this addition of performance measures is the emphasis on increasing doses. Here's the issue. If we're only enforcing these measures in young male ambulatory patients like those enrolled in the trials, that is fine. By all means, increase the doses of drugs. But what happens in the real world is because there's a financial incentive to label literally everybody with as much disease as possible, Clinicians will be nudged to advanced meds in older, more frail adults who would never have been enrolled in the trials. That's going to lead to trouble. 
I know Bobak and his co-authors will counter this and say, no problem, John. We say that all you have to do in this is document all these things. And I know that's true on paper, but I can just tell you that these performance measures lead to a culture change where people get labeled with heart failure and people are incentivized to give older, frail patients more drugs. We have to resist that urge. So I would have liked the issue of bedside translation of the trials to be front and center. Who are we talking about when we're talking about using these drugs and heart failure? A final comment on the heart failure measures. Another thing that bothers me about the beta blocker and heart failure recommendations is that a ton of patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction also have atrial fib. Why is there no accommodation for the fact that very strong evidence from individual level patient meta-analysis from the beta blocker trials suggests that when there is AFib and heart failure with reduced EF, beta blockers don't reduce death rates. Now, beta blockers don't harm patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. It's just that there's no benefit in this group. And I'll reference the Kocheka et al. meta-analysis in Lancet. It's a really strong meta-analysis. At minimum, I would like to be able to use short-acting beta blockers when there is both AFib and a rapid rate in patients with heart failure reduced ejection fraction. But again, if you do that, you get dinged on the performance measures. Maybe a future document could address this issue. Final topic quickly is an AHA preview. Now, next Friday, I'll have a full AHA preview as the meeting actually starts on Friday. The podcast comes out Friday afternoon, so next Friday morning sessions at AHA, the first two late-breaking sessions, will occur before the podcast comes out. Here are some quick highlights of that first session. The first trial involves a novel oral agent called Omacamtiv Macarbil, which is a cardiac myosin activator that has been shown to improve parameters of systolic function. The Galactic HF, this is an RCT of 8,000 patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. It compared omacamtiv macarbil to placebo. We've already learned by press release early in October that the myosin activator met its primary endpoint of CV death and heart failure events, composite endpoint. The hazard ratio was 0.92, so only an 8% relative risk reduction. But the drug did not reduce the key secondary endpoint of CV death. There will also be two studies looking at replacement of vital minerals. The vital rhythm study is a sub-study of the bigger study, vital, which was a huge RCT previously reported comparing vitamin D and omega-3, and that study found no reduction of CV events or cancer incidence. The vital rhythm study will look at whether or not vitamin D or omega-3 reduce AFib incidence over seven years. The second trial of note in that session is the AFFIRM AHF trial looking at ferric carboxymaltose in iron deficient patients admitted for acute heart failure. Now, this study narrowly missed statistical significance on the primary endpoint, but sit down for this, and I'm not making this up. The press release had this sentence, quote, a pre-specified sensitivity analysis considering the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic revealed a statistically significant difference in favor of the infusion. My gosh, that couldn't possibly win the SPIN Award of 2020. The second late-breaking clinical sessions will feature two trials on the polypill and a report from the Swedish cardiopulmonary bioimage study, which is a large population-based cohort study used to predict CAD in the general population. The big story of this five-day meeting comes in the fourth late-breaking session on Sunday. This is the Samson trial. This is an N of 1 trial from the Imperial College London group of Daryl Francis. The Samson trial may answer one of the most important questions in primary practice and cardiology, and that is, do statins actually really cause more side effects than placebo, or is it all nocebo effect? Next week, I'll have more preview of AHA. So that's it for this week in cardiology, and as always, I'm grateful that you listened. Thank you, and remember, friends, please, If you like this podcast, it really helps if you could give us a rating. Take the time to write a review. That way others can find us. Until next week, this is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org on Medscape.